OpenShift storage has many flavors and with all the flavors comes a spaghetti of concepts and acronyms. CSI, persistent volumes and claims, software defined, SAN, fiber channel, storage class, and the list goes on. In this video, I will go over fundamentals that should help you make a better decision when building or consuming storage solution for OpenShift infrastructure. Let's start with the basics. Uh, we have our OpenShift cluster and black box called storage. We'll go over different type of storage later, but for now assume it can be any enterprise type storage. To enable integration between OpenShift and storage, the OpenShift administrator will install what we call CSI driver. CSI driver is a software that translates operations between OpenShift and your storage system. CSI drivers are created and maintained by storage vendors and one of its roles is to create storage classes. And for example, in one OpenShift cluster, you can have storage classes for let's say, Pure Storage, Dell EMC, another software defined storage, etc. Now, let's bring our users to the mix. User want to run their workloads that require storage, such as VMs or containers. The storage is being requested via persistent volume claims or PVC in short. The user also has an option to select a storage class, which as we discuss, is directly attached to its own storage backend. This is when a CSI provisioner makes an API call to our black box storage. And depending on the storage type, it requests LUN or volume, which then the CDI sidecar turns into PV or persistent volume and binds it to the PVC. Finally, when the VM or container gets scheduled, CSI provisioner attaches the volume to the appropriate worker machine and ultimately the workload itself. Let's demo what we discussed in the live environment. I need to warn you in advance, even though the user experience is consistent for different storages. Since storage vendors control how the CSI driver work, each installation method will be at least a bit different. This first step might be common across storage vendors. I am using an awesome pure flash storage array. Thank you pure for sending it to me. I want my sand storage to be robust and perform at the highest level. So I am enabling multipathing for my fiber channel storage network. Example YAML file is in the description below. This is machine config, which means I'm defining a YAML config file that will set the state of my bare metal machine. After a few minutes, machines come back as schedulable and I can verify it by logging into their shell and checking typical Linux multipath config. The next step is pure storage specific. I need to create a service user and a token that will be used for my OpenShift to authenticate. The token is stored in a JSON secret file that will be created under the Portworx namespace. Finally, we're going to install Portworx operator in OpenShift and then follow steps under central.portworx.com to create a new spec for, in my case, Portworx CSI driver directly attached to a fiber channel storage. There is another option for running pure slash portworks as software defined storage and I'll cover this option with many more later in this video. Now either save the specs and generate the YAML file or run the kubectl command generated by the website to finish the installation. This will take a few minutes but the end result should be a working OpenShift integration with this pure SAN storage. Also, before we start creating volumes and PVs, let's create a volume snapshot class for this storage backend. Moment of truth. Let's see if it works. We will change our persona and become a consumer and OpenShift user. For that, I'm first requesting a PVC, persistent volume claim. I can select a storage class and for that I will use our just created pure storage integration. Access mode will be set for read and write many in case I want to use this volume with virtual machines that require a live migration. The size is a bit peculiar, so it's easy for me to find it later. Finally, a volume type and we're off to the races. That was quick. Now I can verify that the volume has indeed been defined on storage array itself and there it is. 
To take it to another level, I will create a virtual machine and this time directly request my storage class to be selected for the SAN storage. Voila! The integration we discussed was based on pure storage, but there are tons of other options out there that will follow a similar pattern. I will link another video demonstrating installation in the usage of OpenShift Data Foundation, so you can compare and contrast the process. Okay, this next part might be the most important aspect of this video, so please bear with me. I personally like to break OpenShift storage into three categories, software-defined storage, traditional SAN storage, and hybrid of the two. Let's double click on those options one at a time. First, software defined storage running on a local drive. There are two leading commercial solutions for this category Portworx Enterprise from Pure and Ceph based solutions from Red Hat or IBM, such as OpenShift or Fusion Data Foundation. Also, if you're trying to compare this option to VMware, this would be closest to vSAN storage. The OpenShift deployment will use two local drives for the OS. We can scale this out to desired number of nodes. There are more servers, but this time dedicated for storage. Two initial storage drives for the operating system, and we fill the box up with additional drives for the software-defined storage portion of this topology. Also, storage scales out by adding additional nodes. Now, let's add the network, and we have the full picture. Please note, and this will become very important later, the network is IP-based so running off the regular network cards, which might also be shared with other network traffic, such as tenant or management networks. One big advantage of this option is that you can collapse these two different type of servers into one role and make them hyperconverge, where you host workload and storage on the same physical machines. Let's keep that on the back of our mind, but roll back to a more traditional model with dedicated servers for storage. Let's get the user into the mix and pretend he, she wants to create an object in OpenShift that requires storage. A virtual machine is a good example of that. To keep the VM fault tolerant, the software-defined storage creates redundant copies of the same VM. And for example, among other things, can create three replicas of that data and store it to its drives. Again, all of this happens on the IP network. So you can imagine it's quite easy to fully saturate your network interfaces, no matter how robust they are. Portworks and Ceph handle replication a little bit differently. Portworks takes a full block of the VM and replicates that to exactly three locations. Where Ceph-based solutions such as ODF breaks each VM into thousands of much smaller blocks and distributes them across entire storage cluster. There are distinct implications to performance, scalability, or management for each. Where Portworx can very often outperform ODF in specific benchmarks, ODF tends to perform more consistently due to its distributed architecture. I really like both of them, and if you came here to learn which one is my favorite, that's not gonna happen. But feel free to share your opinion in the comments section down below. Let's move to the second category of storage, traditional SAN storage. There are many commercial options available. I'm listing a few of them that I have personally worked with, but know there are more out there. We start with our OpenShift nodes and two local drives just for the OS. Then we add a big bad storage array, which usually runs on proprietary hardware and software. We cannot forget about networking. First, a non-storage IP network, for all non-storage traffic, east, west, north, south traffic, etc. And with the big bad storage, we also need a big bad dedicated storage network. This doesn't have to be an IP network. It's very common for this to use a fiber channel connectivity, an extremely fast storage network that avoids some of the overheads of managing TCP IP stack. Still, you can technically qualify iSCSI or NFS protocols in this bucket, even though they do take advantage of IP networks. Regardless, let's bring our user in and have him, her create some data. This time, when the user creates a virtual machine, a CSI driver communicates with a storage array that creates an already full tolerant volume or LUN and attaches it to a physical host in the form of a persistent volume that will be used as a data volume for the VM. 
Again, all that storage network traffic occurs on the dedicated storage network. And again, there's no need for the user to worry about replication. That process is handled by a secret sauce implementation of the storage vendor itself, including things like deduplication to save on storage use, caching for faster performance, and many more. Now, the user wants to create a second VM and another fault tolerant volume gets generated and mapped to a VM data volume just like the first one. If we compare option two, traditional storage, with option one, software defined storage, the SAN can be very often a better performing option when it comes to IOPS. Also, with a dedicated storage array, you typically get more option for its management. Storage array can also be easily managed by a storage team, whereas with a software defined storage, the line between who manages the storage is very often blurry. Okay, problem solved. We should all use traditional storage, right? I wish it would be that easy. There are a few caveats worth considering. First, since every new workload that needs a storage creates a volume or LUN, that translates to a lot of API calls and overall management churn between OpenShift and the storage array itself. And since traditional storage arrays are very often built on proprietary hardware, they have not all been designed to handle constant requests for new LUNs. Also, not all the storage teams out there are thrilled with a dynamic model where the software can request more storage willy-nilly without them approving it. Finally, the cost of the dedicated fiber channel fabric and proprietary hardware can be higher than running on more common x86 hardware with a regular TCP IP network stack. In this case, we need to investigate option number three, software defined storage abstracting traditional storage. So a hybrid of the first two. For the VMware folks out there, this would be an alternative to a VMFS. I am listing four commercial solutions here, but I'm only serious about two of them. IBM Fusion Access for SAN and InfoScale Arctera. I will explain in a moment why. We're going to start with the same looking architecture as option number two. Desired amount of servers for OpenShift and a big bad storage array and a dedicated storage network. Let's consider using Portworks or ODF first. Do you remember when I talked about both of them handling its own replication and also handling all the storage traffic over the IP network? Here's the part where this is important. Let's say your storage admin doesn't want the constant churn of API calls and hundreds or thousands of LUNs on a storage array. So he pre-allocates for you a limited number of LUNs. Both Portworks and Ceph-based solutions like ODF would need at least one volume per physical host. Also remember that those LUNs are already fault tolerant in other words, some level of replication already happens in a storage array itself. For simple math, let's assume it's three copies of the data on a storage array. Now the user comes in and tries to create its VM. Both considered SDSs will follow the same pattern as they did when using a local storage. First, they will replicate the VM three times and then distribute all the replicas over the IP network. This creates a few issues. First, it will multiply the number of replicas, and since we assume the storage array already has three copies, we need to multiply that by three additional copies of our software storage, resulting in nine copies of the same data. That's potentially a lot of overhead. I have to give some credit to Portworks here, however, since they copy the entire VM block into one place, on the storage, if the storage array is equipped with a deduplication functionality, and most of them are, the size will ultimately be decreased by the storage array back to three copies only. That's a win for Portworks. Unfortunately, there's a second drawback that affects both ODF and Portworks. All that data with the replication itself will have to be transmitted over the IP network and then one more time over a dedicated storage network. That's double the storage network traffic. And if your IP network is shared with your tenants or it's not very robust, then that can spill to a noisy neighbor situation and degradation of the performance for the entire solution and not just storage. 
As you can see, it's not perfect, but hey, at least we don't put the strain on the storage array with a constant API calls and the storage admins have full control over their storage arrays. And if your IP network is robust enough to handle both storage and tenant traffic, then by all means, it could be considered as an option. I have mentioned there are two other options that might work a bit better. I'm talking about Arctera and IBM Fusion Access for SAN. Unlike Portworks and ODF, these two are file system based solutions. With both of them, we can ask our storage admin to just carve a single LUN or a set of LUNs and connect the same LUN or a set of LUNs to every single server in our environment. Again, these LUNs are already fault tolerant and have a number of replicas managed by the array. Arctera and IBM Fusion don't need to write additional replicas. They just write the VM data volume on the file system on the host. And since we have access to the same LUN on every single host, the data volume is automatically available on the remaining hosts. No replica overhead and no need to write them multiple times over the network. You might say option three is the best. Why would anyone consider anything else at this point? And I'd say, hold your horses. Here's the big gotcha, cost. With option three, you not only have to pay for expensive hardware and network, but also the additional software comes at cost as well. In other words, if you don't already own a storage array with all the switching, option three becomes the most expensive. But if you already have all the hardware, then it might make sense to abstract it with the software and gain additional functionality. That was a lot. And there's more, but not for me. My colleagues Brenda and Chris have recently presented an even deeper view of inner workings of CSI drivers at the KubeCon in North America. Link for their video in the description down below. Go check it out. I hope you enjoyed this video or at least got some clarity on the whole storage spaghetti thing. In any case, thanks for watching.